<laughs> okay. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Laura Ann Edwards, and welcome to um, an exciting session here in, in session six of the Art and Science of Systems Thinking. Um, it is my true pleasure um, and, and quite the achievement to get her, I might say, um, <laughs> uh, to welcome my friend Linda Booth Sweeney uh, to talk today about all things systems thinking and kids and how that fits into formal and informal education. Um, so Linda, let's just start. I, I, it, you're an expert and prolific author on systems thinking and uh, have spent a lot of time learning and experimenting or investigating how we teach systems thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, what have you learned about the process of simply teaching it? Can it ha you know, is it, is it a, what's the system of the system of teaching systems thinking, if you will? Well, um, I think just uh, honestly for the people that are on, you know, this call, I think I would, if that's okay with you, I think starting with what it is might be helpful because you might have people who have, you know, haven't been part of the whole thread of conversation. Um, and I, what I have found, and this has, this does answer your question, that starting with what people already know mm -hmm. is a fantastic place to start. So, for example, we know the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? We know an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, we know all these, you know, adages, let's say, they get passed on from, you know, grandma, grandpa <laughs> to, to the next. And actually, there's wisdom in that. That is, you know, when you when you really unpack it, there's it's a lot about you know understanding interconnections. It's a lot about the systems ideas. Okay, and I actually think that starting with people with what people know, um, whether it's from their own culture, using their own stories, um, mm -hmm. using examples from their newspapers, um, that their chronic behavior, let's say, that they experience. Then they are they they the systems thinking doesn't sound so conceptual, it's it's real. We've just put some codified, let's say, the concepts and frameworks, but it's ancient. You know, I think you probably know, but one of the books I did um, have written is called Connected Wisdom, and that is folk tales from around the world that are that, that show the, the living systems principles in each one of those folk tales. And that process made me realize that. You know, Aesop and you know, Nigerian folktale or Chinese folktale. Um, they're a lot of the same wisdom, uh, but it's you wouldn't necessarily call it uh, systems thinking. So, starting with what we already know, mm -hmm. and is it okay to share my screen? Because I think this might be a good place to start. Just um, and we can come back if you want to like unpack that even more. You know, I do. <laughs> okay, so let me just share this real quick. Um, Okay, so, um, and I do think one of the, we, we have, one of the things that we might not be thinking about is that systems think is in systems thinking, um, the concepts are inherent in a lot of what we're seeing happening in the world today. So I think there's multiple forces about why we're starting to see more demand for systems thinking. External, what's happening in the world. Think about the pandemic, you know. If we do not know that we live in what Martin Luther King called the interrelated structure of reality, then you know we've been under, you know, under a rock. Sorry, <laughs> you know, you know, my even little kids know that what happens a couple thousand miles away can influence whether I can go to school or go shopping or have a play date. You know, so there's a felt sense right now of just how tightly connected we are, which I think we can actually really build on. But when I think about like these these young ladies that I ran into at a climate uh, march just before COVID, they are they're calling for systems change, not climate change. They they actually they get that it requires some sort of intersectional leadership, multiple uh, actors. You know, the, the schools, the businesses, the farms. You know that that it's not just um, one you know approach. When I asked them. You know, what do you mean by systems change? They're like, well, you know, we're not really sure, but they knew that they had to go, you know, their intuition was right. So part of the education, I think that 
I want to pay attention to too is education and and not just in formal school settings, but mm -hmm. in, in in all in many different kinds of settings. But so this is part of the external kind of motivation. I think we see it in circular economy, regenerative ag, living buildings, for researchers, community-based participatory research, very systems oriented. Um, you you just froze a little bit. Um, even restorative justice has an effect. So you, we're seeing. All these, you know, the ride, you know, living better, you know, what's underneath them, I think many of them is systems thinking. So you have that. And then um, you also have internally, what I mean by that is within education, mm -hmm. we finally have the rise of um, what's called a cross cutting concept. So if you think about it, um, and that's the next generation science standards, the way I grew up, and I don't know if I think it's probably similar in some cases, but you know, English was when, in one class, the bell rang. Science is in another class, the bell rings, you know, math in another class, and you go through your schooling compartmentalized, right? But finally, I think the standards are saying, wait, wait, there's concepts that cut across, you know, biology, history, math, and that some of those cross-cutting concepts are systems, systems oriented, because we see uh, it's a set of interrelationships that drive westward expansion. It's a set of interrelationships that drive predator-prey relationships and, and ecology. You know, there's, there's very um, similar uh, concepts in very in different disciplines. And we're teaching kids now, it's not required, I don't think NGSS is, you know, um, optional by school uh, district, but mm -hmm. for kids who are feeling some sort of cognitive dissonance, you know, that everything was chopped up this is a much more kind of coherent way to show them the, the, the bridge between their experience. And if you think about it, when they get out into the world, climate change is history, geography, politics, science, you know, it's all those interacting and they, when do they get to build that muscle to not just do analysis, which is breaking things down into parts, right? But mm -hmm. integration systems, so I just want to show you one last thing and I'm going to stop the kind of yeah, no, it's good. the other thing that I find really fascinating. I'm talking about these forces that are happening. Right. And by the way, you and I share a common love for Buckminster Fuller. Right. And one of the things Bucky said was don't fight forces, use them. And I think these are some of the forces that are at play right now that we can really work with when it comes to developing a systems view of the world, if you will. Um, but there was an, a great research study in, um, on CNN that talked about children, really young children, because I know that's one of the things we'll talk about, but <laughs> they're, they are curious about the causal structure of the world. And the study, the study suggests that children uh, lean towards causal discovery in books because of its rewards. And here's the thing that I found really in interesting, whoops, sorry. Um, that there's, when they're seeking explanations and when they finally understand the explanation, they feel like there's a chain and some mastery over their part of the world. So giving, you know, not, have, not experiencing the dissonance, but feeling a mastery about, oh, I understand how this is connected to that. I can use that same, you know, understanding for other situations. So um, I, I think that's research. And that would be a question I would have for all the research researchers on this, you know, live stream is, you know, what, 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 what do we know about why we don't see systems? Why is systems thinking not more prevalent? What research is out there to support the, um, you know, conceptions of, of complex systems? I know some, I did some as part of my, you know, Harvard um, dissertation. Um, so that, you know, I think to get those, if you remember those young ladies, at the beginning with the climate change, what what kind of fundamental building blocks could be included in their integrate in their schooling that when they get to the point where they're out there demanding systems change, they they can be, be even more articulate <laughs> and more demanding, if you will, than the adults who many of us were not 
taught to think in these ways, you know? So I'm just going to show you one last thing, because what am I talking about, you know, with systems? I have spent, I, you can't see all the gray hair, but I have spent many, many years looking across disciplines. I came out of the system dynamics. I did all my system, my training at MIT when I was at Harvard. But then I really, thanks to Fritjof Capra, Mary Catherine Bateson, um, you know, Elise Boulding, um, and many other people, I really expanded my view. Uh, and Bucky, you know, the view of, that really includes living systems. And this is just a very short list. It's a partial list of language that is common across all of those systems approaches, if you will. They might say it a little differently, but the basic idea is very similar. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give that as a grounding for you know what are we talking about. Um, so let me stop sharing, and I might have got a little excited. So you got to tell me. No, no, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful, and and it's funny. Um, I I can I, I think I'm I'm not I'm not unique in this, but I would say that I equally read. Uh, epic fiction. So whether that was fairy tales, and then later, of course, my, my drug of choice, science fiction. Um, um, but one of one of my favorite children's books that I still have is Tell Me Why. <laughs> right? I was the why kid. And I, oh. I, I didn't want, I didn't want short, glib answers. I really wanted to, I want you to explain to me why the frog makes that sound. Um, and when, and how many frogs and do the frogs are the frogs happy and I needed to know everything. Um, there's a question in here from from Matt. I'm going to read it out to you, Linda. It says, over the last 20 years or so, our educational system seems to be stressing early specialization, even at the junior high level. The conventional wisdom is that businesses and individuals should concentrate on their strengths um, as a means to increased income. Can these trends be overcome or is the financial incentive for specialization too strong? I think that's a fabulous question, mm -hmm. really fabulous. Um, and it's so interesting, Matt, because I have been seeing, I think that trend is really is there. What I'm seeing on the demand from businesses and, the, and universities and the kind of inquiries I'm getting is um, systems leadership systems change how do i you know so it, i think if you really look part of it and i have a i do have a thought part of it is looking at the trends in the demand for talent selection you know what's showing up in talent selection um, i think you'll see a lot more you know there's a they have different language for it but let's just call it um you know um integrate in, an integrative view or to be able to do design thinking systems thinking that that is becoming more those who can step back and see the big picture and go back into the detail, mm -hmm. um, I think that's actually growing. And what would be really interesting to, to very specifically try to address that trend, you know, because we're talking about a trend, um, is to make it um, to amplify the voices who are saying, but for this world now, for what we're facing, we actually are cautious of over specialization. And we're looking for those who, who can be more integrative, more comprehensive, you know. But but I don't I don't think the voices are out there. And I think if the, let's say for you know, human resource managers, those who are involved in talent, um, could actually help to address that trend. Because I think if schools, some schools, are going to pay attention to what the, the demands are, you know, in the environment. So. But educational systems don't live in a vacuum, right? They're highly political. They have yeah. massive um, cultural and and financial constraints. I mean, talk about a thorny issue. Um, so one of the things that, that comes up for me when thinking to talk to you is if adults barely have a systems vocabulary or coherent adults as a non-homogenous but massive um, group, um, how, how can we, how, how can we, if, if it's hard, you know, it's hard enough to teach adults who are, are, are ready for the conversation. Um, how do we 
enlist enough adults to then implement a systems approach in our schools or in, in the larger educational mesh that surrounds our kids. Yeah, so you're not talking about general adults. You're talking about those who are in schools as educators or administrators? Well, them too, but no, it's, it's like the, the conversation happens apart from the educators, right? It, like what actually gets passed in a state or, or nationally for an oh, educational right. system is a bunch of people who are not really thinking about any of those things. Um, and I don't mean to get into the politics of it. I'm, I'm saying that the actual challenge of uh, amplifying and providing a vocabulary that gives, that makes sense, that folks understand. So to, to Matt's point, if, if the, the trend is to say, we want to know who's going to be a great Olympic swimmer or the most brilliant mathematician, and we want to, we want to, you know, put resources around those strengths, um, or, or support those to, to bolster who have, have perceived weaknesses, whatever that, that balance is, that that's, that's different than saying, you know, that's a very different thing to that say, we want our kids to have a more broad perspective so they're ready for the complex world, <laughs> right? They're gonna, have to, they're gonna have to take on these things that we can no longer pretend are not systems challenges. Um, so the, there, there's the disconnect between getting adults literate enough to be willing to maybe hand it off to the research and, and teacher community to rethink this, this process and education with kids, right? Isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and I'm specifically so I'm a, trying to get yeah. from you because you've, you've taught systems thinking. So it's, it's and, you know, and, and in my little effort in this incubator series, it's challenging enough to have a prolonged discussion and I, 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 the rubber hit, yeah. hits the yeah. road. So here's, here's, oh my gosh, there's so many levels of answers all the way up to our current administration and some ideas I have there, but let's get really grounded and practical. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you think about it, the schools that are adhering to or striving for the next generation science standards, I'm just going to take that one because there's other ones. Um, it's, the, it's policy, if you will, it's an expectation that they're teaching at different grade bands about systems and systems models and related concepts. What are the resources that they have? How can they show, um, what kind of response are they getting from kids? Um, right now, I think that's a very, um, this low hanging fruit. There's mm -hmm. very little resources out there for that for that need and that need is now there so when you ex when you meet that need with um you know i've created an animation with um, david mccauley that's called thinking about systems um i have a book called the climate change playbook you know um, and I'm, I'm just putting a couple of things into that need there's a lot of other people the waters center for systems thinking creative learning exchange echo literate center for echo literate literacy but um, I think when you directly meet that immediate need, uh, then you can start to show exemplars, right? Um, and so I think I would look at what are the teachers being incentivized or what, what's, what are they demanded of right now? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then blow that up with you know, really great resources and examples. You know, That's one way, okay? Mm -hmm. That's just trying to get traction, right? I have a lot of teachers that reach out to me because they personally just have to teach systems in their class. Mm -hmm. It's hard because they're, it's not what they're expected to do, right? But they have to teach about climate. You know, so we, we talk about the climate as a bathtub and so they can integrate it in, but they're just integrating it in, you know, with their own will, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Um, and so the other thing I think that could, at a larger scale, like you have to change scales, you know, I think at a larger scale, if I think about this, if I've got this right, and I might not have this exactly right, but I remember when 
uh, President Biden took over office, he said, we are committed to addressing four intersecting crises, you know, climate, racial justice, um, economic equity, and the fourth one is just kind of went out of my brain, but it, you know, imagine it, it'll come. And um, so I think they, they created a, a, com a committee that crosses over. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you have to fundamentally look at the intersections between race and climate mm -hmm. and equity. They're not separate. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have that at the very highest level, what are the skills that those in those that working group need to have? Mm -hmm. That can, if somebody's really articulating it, many people, not just a, you know, that can trickle down to, well, you know, we're asking our, you know, senior level people to be thinking and acting and making the connections visible or what, you know, whatever. How's that showing up in our education? Mm -hmm. So that's a little wishful thinking, I know, on my part, but I am still, the fact that we're, we're establishing something, a, a group that looks across and is really in tune with the intersectionality, if you will, that's a really good sign. That's part of a movement. The movement, I mean, not, I wouldn't call it a movement, but it's, you know, a trend that's, that I think it's all about trying to build on that. Well, the trend of seeing policy, uh, and it, it plexers on this thread will know that I, I always ask the question of, what can we do to uh, make a dent in the thinking of funders to require or at least ask in anything that they are interested in seeing researched? Can they, can they, how, what can they do to put some intentionality into things being intersectional and interdisciplinary um, in their approaches, right? In a, in, a, in a research framework, right? There's so much urge to put all the resources into hyper-specialization. And I, I, I keep feeling like education is one of those things that is huge, uses, uses a huge amount of societal resources and, 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 and upset, emotional, you know, attached to it, but it isn't in the room with these other departments very often. So I didn't actually get to mention this to you, and I think you might know this, I don't know, but I just finished leading a three-year uh, foundation learning collaborative, so 15 foundations from around the world, um, and the, the name we nicknamed it Suzy, Systems Understanding for Social Impact, and they came together, you know, four or five years ago, and then it launched, you know, a little while ago, but um, to really roll their sleeves up and understand what would it mean as a foundation mm -hmm. if I were to grant in a way or work with other foundations in a way that actually supported systems change. And it's, it's countering exactly what you're saying. I know the isolated um, rifle shot approach, it actually, what showed up is they have to actually rethink of themselves, their own identity, because uh, many times, and I'm not saying this was these particular foundations at all, but the, the, the mindset is um, save the day, you know, and our name on this, this grant or whatever. And that actually, is not necessarily the best approach for systems change. You need the voices of people who are you know, being influenced at, at the decision-making table. You need to actually potentially collaborate with other foundations, mm -hmm. which is surprisingly often not done. So there's a really great example I would point people to that's happening right now that I'm sharing widely. Um, it's called the Cancer-Free Economy uh, mm -hmm. Network. And it's um, was, um, funded by the Garfield Foundation. And Garfield is, in my mind, one of the major leaders of really putting these ideas into action. But they, the way that that happened was they had multiple organizations come with businesses, researchers, um, I don't know if policy was in there, I, I don't, but multiple, they presented as a group, but a diverse stakeholder group mm -hmm. for this let's create a cancer-free economy network. Um, an, an amazing, you know, who, that's, that's right, that's a big North Star, right? Think about it. Let's have a cancer-free economy. But they are engaging many different parts of the, you know, of the community. 
um, using systems mapping, you, but really leveraging the idea of networks. Um, and, and there's a whole a research component to it. So it's complex. Well, that's, it's, that's extremely it's, encouraging. And, and I, uh, it is. It is. yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll put the, you know, we'll put links in about that. Um, so switching back, getting back to the, the, the practice of teaching kids systems thinking yeah. and what that looks like. Um, there's a question from Michael. How does special education, uh, especially for dyslexia, the, the hidden disability, if you will, fit into systems thinking in different cultures? I don't know how to answer the question about in different cultures. I don't have, I have a close family member with dyslexia, so I know that, but I don't know it in beyond you know, my, my experience. But, um, and, I, and what I think is that um, systems thinking can be very visual. It doesn't have to be necessarily, I mean, not quantitative or even word-based, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the, um, one of the things that say I start with, and I think this would be, in, is, it, is it Michael who asked the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Ask Michael if I'm answering his question. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the things I start with often, especially with little kids, is I ask them, this is kind of gruesome, but I ask, you know, if you cut a cow in half, do you get two cows? And, you know, four years old and up, they say, no, of course not, you know, because they know that the nose has to be in the front and the tail has to be in the back. And if you cut a cow in half, it doesn't make two cows. Well, fundamentally, what you're getting to is systems integrity, that the way the parts are arranged matters, right? So your family is a system, right? Your classroom could be considered a system. So there's, it's, it's, but we don't see those connections, right? Mm -hmm. We have to imagine them. And I believe, and I don't have, this is a research question, okay? So Michael might take this. Um, dyslexia and systems thinking is it a natural fit? Um, it feels like it really could be, but I don't have the research to prove, you know, how systems thinking approaches can be, you know, either need to be adapted or are, are readily adopted um, by that audience. Well, that teased tease me up perfectly. Thank you, Michael. Um, how visual or kinetic um, does, I mean, I, I have my own, uh, you know, feelings that, it, that it's a, there's a spatial thinking inherent in systems thinking that le leads itself to the essential tool uh, of, of visual thinking, but, but specifically for teaching systems to kids. Um, how, how in, a, in a practical way, how is drawing or, you know, forming a circle, physical, physical movement yeah. Um, I think it's huge, a huge. I'm a hundred and ten. I'm, I've always been an experiential educator. So I, I came, I used to work for Outward Bound. Outward Bound taught me that um, games and activities help you to be a student of your own behavior. So you just do, you just play. And in the process, you see, oh, well, I thought this way, your, you know, your mental models show up basically, but it's very engaging, very interactive. And so I actually have a book called, you, I, you might know this, the Systems Thinking Playbook. So it's, you know, 30 exercises, games to build systems thinking capacity. Teachers use it with kids, adults use it with, in management. And I could actually do one that would take a minute if you want to, if I could show you. Sure. But just to really emphasize, I think that's the way, you know, I would never start with something text-based. I would start with one of one of the games, or I'd start with something. The one I'm going to show you might be a little more sophisticated, um, but post-it notes on a big white piece of paper, a connection circle where they just start to make the connection between that argument on the playground and kind words or hurt words or you know something that's really dynamic really works well, um, I think for kids. So I'll show you this real quickly, okay? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, and you have, to, you have to do it with me, by the way. This is- Oh, okay, I'm just great. All right. All right. All right, so you're gonna take your finger and you're gonna make a clockwise circle on the ceiling and you're looking up at it, okay? Just right. nice and round. 
Okay. And now slowly just bend your elbow and keep coming down until you're looking down on that circle. Good job. There you go. Keep going. Yes. Which way is it going? Right. Oh, you just woo. Yeah. That was interesting. I'll tell yeah. you about that in a second. Okay. Yeah. Don't 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 think. Don't think. Just do with me again. One more time. Ready? Nice and round on the ceiling. Yeah. yeah. Slowly bend your elbow and just keep. Don't try to make it go anywhere. Just keep looking and then look down on it. Which way is it going? Ah, uh, no, it's of course a reverse circle. Okay. I'm getting younger by this by this by the turn. You you what? I'm getting, oh, you're getting younger. <laughs> but so I use that a lot, especially with um, older kids or adults, because let's say in an organization or even in a school, this is what's going on. You know, you know. Um, Let's say that teach, you know, there's a lot of teacher attrition or, you know, this is at the top level of an organization, they're saying this. And at the bottom, they're saying, no, no, it's like this. And, and bottom is just another perspective. I'm not saying bottom, um, but it's the same system, right? We're seeing it from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that gets to one of the some, somewhat undiscussed um, outcomes of systems thinking, I think, is empathy and the ability to hold different perspectives and that they're legitimate. Um, and I will tell you, I can, I did all these workshops virtually over COVID. The common thread was, I feel much less likely to demonize or polarize others with the system's view because they see that those are, do you, do you know the story of the blind man and the elephant? Sure. Yeah, they see that the different parts are arguing from their own perspective, let's say, but they're still part of the elephant, right? And um, yeah, I think some of the work that Peter Sangi and his group are doing now around compassion and systems is really going in that that direction. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we can't um, we can't get too tech. We we can get technical, but there is a big emotional intelligence side to systems thinking. Um, so let's, let's talk about very, very young kids, right? And, okay. and whether, whether we in this country or, or you know, around the world, how pre-K and, and earlier is informed culturally um, around what, what one teaches one's kids or formally in a pre-K environment. How, how early is, like, what, what can be, what, well, let's just start with formal pre-K. What can be or should be um, put into those, the, the, those practices? Well, I will tell you, and I, um, as a, the other part of my work is I write children's books. And, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and um, I have, one that just got accepted by a publisher and I'm very excited about it. Um, and pretty much all of them so far have a little systems piece, but I don't bring it out, you know, so it's um, in your face, but it's there, right? Um, so to answer your question, there's another one that I'm working on right now that is um, basically about the, the magic when things are separate versus when they get together, mm -hmm. okay? so. That, as you know, is the interaction produces something greater. I said earlier, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The thing is, we don't see the interaction between the eggs and the flour and the vanilla and the sugar and the baking soda that go add the heat and you've got a delicious cake, right? Kids know that something magic happens, right? When they're mixing and then they're... what I think and that this the book, that book that I'm working on three years old and up. Could even, they'll chew on it at age one. <laughs> they won't necessarily get, you know, but they'll, they really get that, you know, that nest that they're seeing maybe has, you know, the combination of fe feathers and, you know, sticks and a bird and, you know, the combination produces something greater or, you know, and so what I'm interested in, and, and I think that it can happen at a very young age, is helping them to first just see interactions and interdependence um, because they know it, they, they experience it. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, we, we can get them to say, well, where else do you see 
something where the com combination produces something else. What kind of magic, you know? Love in a family is is that health is there's there's not one thing that produces your health, right? It's sleep and it's it's you know good food and you know um, maybe exercise. You know, it's a combination. So I'm I'm trying to get young kids to just be aware and pay attention because I want them to be designers. I want them to be able to design positive interactions, but we first just have to be sensitized to the fact that we can actually play a role in how things are interrelating. What is the science or is there science uh, uh, around, uh, or yet, around what systems wisdom or intuition kids have inherently and when do they lose it? Yeah, you know, I could dig into that. I wonder if I have that right in my, I, I did, um, let me just see. I, I put a rubric up that would show um, mm -hmm. that. And if not, I will be able to um, share that. But let me just see if we can find that real quick. And it's hard to say, Laura, that they lose it. I think they get otherwise focused. I don't think any of us are. Well, there's, a, you know, there's the, the sort of common uh, complaint that we that the that folks you know that we, we beat the cre creativity out of uh, of kids or lots of kids fall to the wayside in our in our in yeah. industrial age school um, framework and then we recruit for highly specialized talent and creativity and bring them into the workplace and then we we beat it out of them there too so it's like ha, ha, you know <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm curious about what is what is 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 inherent and needs just and needs to be fostered versus um, what's taught. Okay, I think I can share my screen. I found it. I actually have it pretty. Um, there it is. Okay. So, so here's a few. Can you see? Oh, here, let me present here. Yeah. Um, there's multiple sources for this. And I think this is a great area of research, to tell you the truth. You know, my dissertation focused on 10 and 11 year olds and their teachers. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, centered at the you know, schools in Berkeley, one who had an edible schoolyard and one who didn't. Um, and we were trying to figure out if, you know, being in an edible schoolyard um, um, promoted systemic reasoning because you were fundamentally thinking about the relationships between seeds and soil and you know and I would say what the most fascinating finding is that there were some 10 year olds who outperformed the educators hmm. not a lot just a couple and I went back to that data over and over again trying to you know I must have made a mistake but then we went into the intake you know what their backgrounds were one of them had you know, a parent who was an environmental activist. Um, so they were exposed at a very early age to this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and the other finding was that we needed to be even more explicit about teaching systems thinking, systemic reasoning, eco literacy, whatever the, you know, um, mm -hmm. but that they could adopt those, you know, that way of, uh, that worldview, if you will. Um, so let me just get to what the different you know, grade bands, I think that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, when they're you know, five and six up to grade two, they understand objects and organisms and they can you know, identify the parts and systems in the natural design world have parts that work together. That's kind of what I'm talking about, right? You know, how these parts interact. Then they get up to, you know, up to here at grade three and five they understand that a system is a group of related parts that make up a whole that you can't divide it. That's my question about, can you cut a cow in half? I just try to go at it like really, um, you know, simply and visually, typically. Mm -hmm. um, and then they could start to, they can start to name the different parts and how they interact. Um, and so, et cetera, you know, it goes up. Um, and these are this is from the Waters Center for um, Systems Thinking. They have you know, habits of mind cards that 
are, are progressive, you know, like keep working at it as you're just a beginner, like seeing the big picture. This isn't as much tied to grades, you know, grade levels as you're talking about or ages. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, same thing in this um, food systems, you know, having different levels of systems understanding. Um, yeah, and the one thing I would say if people are interested in what it could look like, right, you know, integrated is I created for the, I worked with PBS with their learning media um, uh, offering and we created a pilot of systems integrated into curriculum. And so this one has to do with mangroves um, and I think that's uh, yeah, K to two. And then we did one, yeah, we, this is what I meant about just visually helping them to see how first, um, how things are connected. And then you dive in deeper into the dynamics that get created. And that's where you get into things like feedback, reinforcing feedback, balancing feedback, get into what also stock and flows, et cetera. So, so, is, 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 so this, just stop. is this yeah. curriculum uh, publicly available? Oh or? yeah, yeah. It's just on um, PBS Learning Media. Okay. Um, and if you go to um, put in systems literacy, it's all available, there's videos. Um, there's a, there's a, I did two videos for them, but there's also a nice piece that's just for teachers. And then one that's geared more towards middle school students to kind of like a work through. So we brought, we've talked about around this a few, a few different ways, but what, what do you see as some of the obstacles to, to, to bringing this uh, discussion and experimentation lab, if you will, into the formal educational system? Just let's start with the United States right now, because that's where we are. Okay, because there's actually some really interesting general obstacles to systems thinking, but we can get there. Well, well no, start so, general then, but I, I do want to, well, yeah. I wonder if that's, yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to have to share my screen again for a minute, <laughs> okay. so hold on. Um, Let's see if I can, uh, um, you know, it might be, well, you're going to have to see me just flip for a second. Well, um, one of the questions that I posted on, uh, on Polyplexus yeah. was the, the, you know, what, what, what do we know about what has worked uh, and what, how can we extrapolate from that? What could work at scale? And so, for example, here in the U.S., I, th I frequently see um, the counterpoint to U.S. education as Finland. Like in Finland, we basically have free range children and isn't that wonderful? And it is wonderful and so appealing. And yet, I, to me, it's given to me with no context of the cultural support network and the culture of Finland, right? The, how, how is it that that works there? Could, could, could all kids be Waldorf kids, right? Um, how, how does that, you know, what, do we have data on and, and can, what can we pull out of that in terms of different educational frameworks specifically that, that have some sort of integrative anything? Like, what do we know as opposed to what we kind of want to experiment with? Can I just understand your question? What do we know about what kids are capable of doing? Well, um, I'm trying to put it, sorry, I am sort of stumbling over this one, but the, the, the bigger topic of obstacles of systems yeah. thinking at large and then here, but um, in, the, in that obstacles list is, yeah. is it what seems to me like a, an unreasonable comparison um, of educational frameworks uh, that are, are in that are unbalanced, right? It is they don't have context. Yeah, context is key, right? You know, um, I think there's a lot written about this, but you know, I think at least in the U.S., our um, our, in our our educational system was to get people into you know assembly lines, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore the bell ringing and therefore the sit down and pay attention. And there, you know, there's a lot of features to our educational system that was trying to develop those kind of- um, It was for mill workers, wasn't it? Yeah, mill workers. Yeah. So um, we have a big undoing 
that needs to happen. And I do think COVID opened that up, mm -hmm. not all the way, but um, parents, many parents who were able, because you know it's, we all are in very different situations, had to take over their children's learning and had to see what was they're actually experiencing. You kind of forget about it, right? You get through that education and you forget. Um, but I, so I think, um, I think to answer your question, I think there's got to be a reckoning about what's the purpose of school? What's the purpose of high school? Asking those really big questions. Mm -hmm. And then um, I mean, you got to get, it's got to be a coordinated effort that allows for alternatives, even more alternatives, or, or allows to test and do, like, that's where research comes in. What's the impact on um, more integrated learning, mm -hmm. right? On you know, what we would measure as performance. That's, there's, there's, I can't name all the body of research that's out there, but I'm sure there's some, and it's typically done in like an action, action learning kind of approach. But I know from my own experience and from others that more, much more research is needed. Okay, so back, back to obstacles and what you were gonna pull up. Oh, okay. So um, let me share. I just find, I find this fascinating. So I'll share some of these with you. And I do think maybe some of these obstacles also play into, you know, why we're stuck and um, you know, where we are now. So, okay, hold on. Let's see. Um, okay, let me just make sure. Well, so, I, uh, yeah, I think this is probably the best. Yeah. All right, well, you already see this, but um, so there's a lot of reasons. I won't name them all now. That's a whole presentation that, um, but, you know, some of the reasons why we don't think in systems, we don't work in that way, even though we live in complex systems, we're not taught to think about them. Right, you, we are when we get to, when I first encountered this body of uh, knowledge was in my uh, mid twenties. Mm -hmm. And it always made me go crazy about why, where was this, <laughs> you know, when I was younger. And I think that's why I'm still on this tear that I'm on. Um, but anyway, um, one is we don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. Just think about it. Have you ever seen a system walking around? <laughs> Not really, right? You know, the, yes, we see our family get in, you know, go somewhere together, but we don't necessarily see how, you know, that, that person's connected to that and that emotional level and that, you know, we don't see that stuff. Media often driving us to event level thinking, short term, the whole idea of looking at patterns over time, what set of interrelationships are driving those patterns, which is, you know, a framework called the iceberg that's pretty popular in systems thinking. That, there's some, there is a new, I've seen um, systems and journalism starting to show up as, you know, um, at that, what's the impact of media on our ability to think in terms of systems? Like we talked a lot about schooling already. Um, I think our everyday artifacts also fragment uh, knowledge um, in our experience. And I'll just want to give you a quick example of that. Um, even think about a hospital, how a hospital is typically organized, you know, appendages are over here, heart is over there, you know, well, I don't, the, it's all very separated. <laughs> and yet, you know, the way the body works is obviously one of our best examples of a system. And then, you know, cognitive reasoning, we live in a feedback rich world, feedback meaning closed loops, let's say of cause and effect. But um, we misperceive that feedback. We think in straight lines versus closed loops. We focus on what's immediate, that's uh, called proximate cause, as opposed to extending our, you know, our view. Um, so so it be, it's hard to go beyond seven variables, right? We need to um, be assisted. That's why mapping can be helpful. That's why computer models can be helpful. But, you know, we're getting there. But I think that's you know, recognizing some of those general you know, limitations. Um, but let me just show you this, because I think this really hits home what we're, how, um, 
how kind of under the radar this is. So this is from an actual seventh grade textbook. And um, these seventh graders were asked, um, number one, see number one, what process begins the water cycle? So I'm curious how you would answer that question. <laughs> If you were, you're going to get quizzed on this, by the way. Right. Um, I guess I would say um, surface water. So I'm going to say evaporation from the ocean as a as a driver. Okay. It's a bad question. It's a terrible question. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. Okay. There is no beginning or end. And I'm sorry I set you up like that. That what I really didn't mean to do that. <laughs> But, but you can see how you feel forced into it, right? They're getting quizzed on this. Think about what that does to you. What that does is to say a cycle has a beginning or an end. That means Palestine and Israel, we start to blame, right? That, 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 one, that one versus looking at the pattern, right? That shift from the part to the pattern is what we want kids to do. That's why I'm writing that book for third three-year-olds that get them to start, you know, focus not just on the, you know, the egg and the vanilla separately, but on what the interaction does, okay? And, you know, it, I mean, think about the seventh grader who's has dissonance in their head because they're like, ah, I gotta pick one, you know? But it's, it's just a fundamentally bad question. And so um, that's, integrated these kind of things I think are integrated in our our world but it's causing more um, reductionist more narrow thinking versus um, you know the kind of thinking that we want which is more looking at the whole how the parts interrelate and the more systems okay but it's that fundamental shift from part to to pattern that for the researchers who are listening to this um, I am looking for support, I am looking for others who really, um, you know, could help me to think about, you know, what's what's the what, what's the body of work that's out there that looks at how that shift happens and what can support it. So, full disclosure um, to those listening along, um, Linda and I are our cohort. Uh, colleagues um, at both the Design Science Studio at the Buckminster Fuller Institute and of a program that Linda referred to of uh, at UC Irvine um, called the Living Systems Collaboratory. So within, within that context, my question or my, my comment to you, Linda, is I, I know we are both, you and I personally, are very uh, excited about and intrigued with the possibilities in experiential design. Um, and I'm, I'm going down the pathway of experiential design for science. Um, and you are within that going for experiential design for the science and practice of education, uh, as, I, as I understand it. So- Oh, I'm, I'm doing that multiple swim lanes. At tell us, time. tell us because it, uh, you, are, you are pushing the edge of exactly um, where, uh, as Neo Martinez says, where science, you know, we're taking science from where it is to where it could be. Um, so, so where are you going with this and, and who's going with you? Yeah, so it's, it's the, not the bane of my existence, but it is my existence that I, I end up in very different um, disciplines um, because systems are, show up in childhood obesity. They show up in, you know, uh, indigenous women and getting more indigenous women in the labor force. They show up in intersecting issues that Biden, President Biden is dealing with, you know. So I, I am not compartmentalized, no surprise, you know, in my who and what I do. Um, but I fundamentally did start out with my just my research at Harvard was how do um, young people and adults intuitively think about complex systems, whatever the application is. And so it crosses over that we're seeing that in science, right? You want collaboration in science. You want, um, so let me see if I'm answering your question. And ask me the question again, because I want to make sure I didn't go, I don't go off. Um, well, I was- Oh, which different discipline? Well, the, 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 you know, the opportunity, I should, let's, let's reframe it. 
um, the opportunity with mixed reality and the and the, the two pieces, right? There, there's the 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 opportunity of of massive data processing and visualization, right. and how that is a component of mixed reality. So the what, what is the what is the opportunity in that systems education process that these now offer? There, what what, what can we do now that we couldn't do before, or where do you where do you see that going? Okay. So you're saying, okay, well, that actually leads me to something that I'm super excited about right now that I could share that is part of what I think is that opportunity. And I'm definitely interested in others playing in that space uh, and engaging. And I say play because it's experimental. Um, but let me show you uh, here at one second. Escape. Let me just get to. Um, uh, yeah, here it is. Okay. So um, one second, I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, so I'll make sure I'm answering the questions because, uh, okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, great. So in terms of what's the opportunity, and I think this applies to almost any discipline, as long as it has to do with um, having to take a more, co to get understanding context. It could be around um, guns. It could be around, like I said, childhood obesity. It could be around, how do we get more collaboration from different scientists for a particular, you know, anything that has to do with um, seeing and leveraging and potentially shifting inter, inter, interrelationships to produce something different, okay? so. What I, because of the Buckminster Fuller Institute residencies that we were in, my push for myself was to really understand augmented reality and virtual reality. I'm mm -hmm. a person who's all about in-person, right? Um, so it was a, a, a journey, um, but I really got it, um, what the potential is. And so one of the things I did was I created um, a, a lab space and something that anybody can go on to right now, it's called spatial and it's spatial.io, that's, that's the URL. And what I found was that, like I said earlier, one of the biggest um, obstacles to systems thinking is we don't see systems, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we do a lot of mapping and, um, uh, but often you can't get the people in the room, you need to get the system in the room. Mm -hmm. It's you gotta get the, the people like the blind men and the elephant, you've gotta get the different players in the room, but if they're in different parts of the country or in different parts of the world, you know, how do you do that? And so um, I, what I, and the other thing, one other thing is that that's virtual reality lets you do that, right, really well. Augmented reality allows you to um, create a system that you can actually end up, you know, interaction among what's, I'll, I'll give you an example where you can actually see how those interrelationships are playing out and you can influence it. So an example of that, um, and then I'll just show you this website real quick. Um, but I, so I mentioned that book Connected Wisdom, right? And it's the different principles. So I was taking all the different stories. One of them is called um, Palace and Hercules and it's by Aesop. And basically Aesop was telling us about reinforcing feedback. He was telling us about escalation in the story. And it's a perfect, like just a paragraph or two story about escalation. And Hercules comes along the road. He sees this monster called Strife. He you know, wants him to get out of the road. He whacks him. Of course, Strife gets bigger. He whacks him again. Strife gets even bigger. And this story goes on. And then Pallas comes in and she's the goddess of wisdom. She says, um, she says, if you cease your blows, you know, strife will, you know, diminish or whatever. And so you really get that, you know, when you have an escalation, part of it is, you know, stopping the aggressive act or whatever to allow for the dynamic, the reinforcing feedback to, you know, de-escalate. Um, so I, we turn that into an augmented reality um, story where kids or adults can can pr they they project it right on their living room or right in their classroom or whatever and they 
especially with kids, they can intervene and they can see if, well, if we had pallets come in, or we, we stopped this escalation at this point, this, you could see what would happen, right? Then mm -hmm. you connect them to like the SDGs and the um, project drawdown and you help them to see how that same dynamic shows up in other situations like the girl effect is a, is a more positive reinforcing feedback. They can recognize that these dynamics, they, they can recognize them and they can potentially leverage them, right? So that's where augmented reality comes in. So what this experiment is, is um, something called Toggle Lab. I'm working with two colleagues, um, Nader Shatirian and Simone Amber. And we're basically trying to leverage, take all the principles that we know about you know, living systems, right? We know better. We should be using those all the time <laughs> and respond to a post-COVID world, which is we need new new ways to collaborate, right? We need new ways to learn together. Sometimes it's gotta be virtual. Um, and to create lab experiences where, um, you know, where they can walk through, what would a healthy system be? Whatever we're talking about. What, you know, what are, how can we diagnose? That's where you get into making the systems visible through, partly through augmented reality, partly through using the different rooms that are available in a virtual space. Um, strategy and then you know engaging getting the system in the room the kind of quality of conversation that you need um and so i'll just say quickly we have, we have two different efforts going on right now one is for working groups that have like a common interest that they want to focus on they would go through these four together and then those who are just interested in capacity building what do you mean by cascading benefits you know how, how would i integrate that into my work um you know so Right now, we're offering, um, you know, we're looking for a, a working group to work with us to test it out at, you know, no charge. And then one, we're going to do a capacity building um, that's also complimentary on June 22nd. So if anyone wants to join, if they go to togglelab.com, there's a um, just a you know information form. You can say, hey, I'm interested. Um, I want to learn more. So, okay, you, you made, made me, I, I've recently been having some conversations um, and, and trying to cycle, circle back personally to understanding where, what's the state um, of the business and the mindset of the gaming industry. And by gaming, I don't mean gambling, I mean video games. Um, and because the reach is is ever growing and the, the, the household penetration of consoles is almost bigger than TVs. Like it's crazy how, what the, the, the reach is. And so there's a relatively new charter called the Charter of, for Positive Play. And part of that is for uh, making sure that, that video gaming and gaming is, stays fun and is, has some compassion and empathy and Right, it's not to, to be to counter bullying, but it it off it tees up the, the the bigger perspective question of the that's a whole other reach and educational system uh, that that really reinforces you know classic archetypes um, found in fairy tales and Joseph Campbell. Right, there's the hero's journey. There's all those things, and it, they are inherently interactive, immersive worlds. Yep, um, and so. The, when we think about what we, back, back to the, the core idea of teaching kids systems thinking, the, the, there's, there's not many, right? Like what media are kids consuming? What, how, 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 how much is like, what, what are the different sectors? Where, where are kids' time and attention really going right now? We might, we might corral them in school for seven or eight hours a day we have a few shots at their attention span. And then they're maybe home a little bit or a lot, depending on the family. Um, and then they might be off in these virtual worlds, both, both intentional like your, 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 your lab and, and you know, escapism, if you will, and socializing in a video game world. So how can, it feels like these things need to come together uh, and reinforce a sense of 
connectedness or agency when, and, you know, cause I think we haven't talked about agency, but part of, part of what I think of systems thinking is understanding that I, I, I am, I'm a piece of that. Right. And so, and what can I affect and what I can't and where do I start? Yeah. That's what I said about complex um, um, empathy. Mm -hmm. But I think the one thing that if taught well, or, you know, given an engaging experience, kids can see that, that complexity is not the enemy. Complexity mm -hmm. is a guide, you know, mm -hmm. that they can be the ones who face it and say, ah, okay, lots going on here. Mm -hmm. you know, that's they have a quick set of ways into the complexity so they're much less likely i said like to polarize they're more likely to ask questions like well who else needs to be here they're more likely to look at a subject in school like to understand why was did westward expansion happen at such a rate you know okay it's the the railroads and then the agri ag, ag land and then it's like you know to start to look at how they create a dynamic mm -hmm. you know so they're much less likely to be okay with a silo. They'll be itchy, you know? They, they have to reach out and connect. Um, so um, in terms of the gaming, I think gaming can be, it's already being done in, you know, I can't name all of them, but um, I think like some, I think it was Brain Pop I saw at one point had some gaming around systems and um, it's, a, it's, it's completely ripe for, mm -hmm. for building systems thinking capacity. Um, mm -hmm. But I, so I'd like to know more of the, you know, you know this, there's a, the, I think at, um, Tina Grotzer at Harvard um, has, is part of a group called Project Zero. And I believe they're actually doing some really good research. Um, it may be David Rose, if I've got that right, um, around the use of games to mm -hmm. build uh, causal understanding, you know, and, and I'm sure there's a whole research component, but I'd personally like to be involved in that and learn more, you know, but I don't, I don't doesn't know. It, doesn't it feel like a, a, a round table that, that, that we should get, make happening um, of the, yeah. the, 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 in, in the, in the story room, if you will, of simple ways to reinforce the, that, that context, because it, that's a learned thing and it hits adult and kid audiences. Um, yeah. So there's a question here in the thread. Um, have you, Linda, have you worked on any projects that incorporate system thinking in youth education specifically to tackle misinformation on social media and news media? I have not. My big project is my own three kids. <laughs> uh, right. So um, honestly, though, I think... Um, oh my gosh, we're dealing with it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, an accusation is made and the conversation around the dinner table is, well, has anybody, do we know what the other point of view is? Do we know, um, but pause. It's a, it's a, I think the systems thinking with that misinformation has to do pause between thought and action. Mm -hmm. And that big pause gets you to look deeper first it's, it's, you're going against, you know, the tide to do that. But I, I do think it's, um, it's just a expanding that space is a big part of it, but I haven't specifically worked on projects for that yet. So it's come up a few times and it's, you know, and it's part of uh, an iterative or design thinking approach, certainly to constantly be asking, am I, am I working on the right problem? Am I asking the right question? Um, is there a good working open source list that the parents um, uh, on the line here can, can refer to? So one of the things that occurs to me is that the world is a little bit overwhelming right now, or can be, and there's so much that a kid asking why or how, or wanting, wanting more context, the parents just don't know. And it's kind of exhausting to have the answer or feel like, in the age of, of search engines that we're supposed to have answers um, or that there is an answer. Um, what, are, what are some, some, I mean, I feel like as a culture, we need to learn to say, not only do I not know or ask 
counterpoint questions or say, let's go find out. Um, do you have any, I mean, since you deal with parent, teacher, student triads, um, teachers don't know everything. Like what are, what, are, what are questions? How do we put it back to kids hungry, spongy minds um, in a way that is, that spurs critical thinking. Yeah. And, right? Well, yeah. And so you started out with resources. That was up also part of your question, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's fascinating because also over COVID, I was asked to work with homeschooling parents and their kids. So they had kids on their lap while we were doing you know, the, the systems work. And it was probably one of the best things I did because I had to talk to the parents and the kids at the same time and mm -hmm. quickly tra you know, translate the ideas. Um, so, um, I th so to answer your question, just first about resources, mm -hmm. there's a, a host of resources. I can send you, uh, I, I often send out big lists to people and you're just making me think, you know, maybe hold my, feet to the fire on this, but um, I need to get that up, that it's just much more accessible because I'm always looking across resources, mm -hmm. you know, echo literacy, systems thinking, um, like I said, restorative justice, but for kids. So I don't have that formalized, but I, I could probably send you a list and then you could share it. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition, um, you know, a few quick resources that are great, more educator focused than parent you know, Waters Center for Systems Thinking, Creative Learning Exchange, Center for Echo Literacy. Those are just a few that I think, and maybe the Center for Echo Literacy might have some more particularly parent oriented. Um, and there's many more, so I'm not listing them all. Um, but those are good places to just get ideas. Um, uh, you can look on Medium. I have some articles on Medium about using children's books. Um, I, uh, one other place, you know, I wrote a book called When a Butterfly Sneezes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really sweet book. It's for parents and uh, teachers to use with kids to see how picture books, like your, like your, your book about why, you know, ones that we already have, like Dr. Seuss turned out to be an, a, a big systems thinker, you know? And so I just show how the different picture books can be used to teach about um, systems or mm -hmm. for, to engage kids. Um, and then there's that connected wisdom book that I told you about. Um, so to answer your question, those are the resources I can just think of off the top mm -hmm. of my head. Um, I also think, you know, getting kids into places like puddle jumpers or nature centers where it's fundamentally about looking at, you know, ecology is a really simple way in. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing about that is it is like I learned from my own dissertation to be a little more explicit and help a young person to transfer what they saw, you know, around the pond life and what they're seeing around, let's say, family life or what they're seeing happening in a class uh, uh, in the classroom. Do you know what I mean? So if we have to actively transfer, it's called in my mind is I, I, I wrote an article about article about homology. So we know what an analogy is, but a homology is more of a pattern that's analogous, not, you know, and so a, a homologous reasoning is, you know, recognizing those patterns across examples. That's a great research area. You know, mm -hmm. who else is thinking about that? How can we foster um, that kind of reasoning? Um, so if anybody wants that article, it's on the Creative Learning Exchange uh, website. So, well, it makes me think. You know, it, it, there, there's you, periodically we'll see some some really excellent PSAs um, to address a very specific awkward situation. You know, how to talk to um, your kids about sex or violence or right, and and there's they can be very thoughtful in terms of their framing. I, I almost feel like there's a PSA we need as a society for how to have a family conversation. Um, how to, right, like, like literally um, teaching, or re reminding, reframing, and making it not so overwhelming, how to have that, that exchange of questions and uh, a discussion 
uh, at, at the dinner table that, that, right. Cause I love that you're thinking that way because I actually, I was just pulling it up. I'm laughing because for the longest time I've been adding to this document that's schoolhouse rocks. Do you remember that growing up? I'm just a bill. On no, Capitol, on right? Capitol. But I outline a schoolhouse rocks for systems. Um, it, and it's, you know, I would love to do that. I just need to find partners you know, that are, that see the value of it. But I, I do think again, that a post COVID world um, is the time to do it. <laughs> you well, know? But, but even more fundamental, right? I, I feel like a common theme in, in all of this approaching and discussing and, and wanting to implement systems thinking is the, there's the folks learning it and wanting to learn it. And then there's the chronic need for facilitation. Uh, and if you will, parents have the agency to be facilitators for thinking within their own families, but they're, they're just trying to get through the day, right? right? And so um, they, not making it so much, oh my God, I've got to go learn a whole right. curriculum. Oh my God, now I've got to teach algebra too, right? It's like, ah, it's too much. Um, but yeah. fundamental shifts. Yep. yep. If you think of it as, you know, innovation for the future or, um, co-creating our future you know well any you know, other the phrase the you know, parents might know about 21st century 21st century critical thinking skills right you know what we're talking about is kind of all under that umbrella but it's um it's more forward thinking <laughs> and it's a little more comprehensive um you know i just want to say one thing that i'm just realizing as we're talking you know, I mentioned Harvard and MIT, and you know, certainly that's sort of one way that I came up. My experience since then has been very diverse, um, and and all different aspects of life. Um, I've been working with a group that I helped that was part of originating called Women Eradicating Racism, um, and uh, and like I said, childhood obesity and a community. It's systems thinking is not, you know, the, per, the, the whole reason why I got into this work is I didn't want to wait until having to get to an MIT or a Harvard. I really appreciate that experience, but it's in the wisdom of the people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, they are who we're talking about, you know, they, they are the, the system. That's why I think starting with what you already know and kind of meeting those two together often, you know, pulling out what you know and then helping to build on that um, is, is really just a respectful mm -hmm. um, approach. It, 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 it makes it much less threatening, you know, that you're bringing in this MIT concept, you know, it's actually not an MIT concept. All my research shows that it was in our ancient folk tales, you know, from way before MIT even existed, you know. Uh, MIT has formalized an approach. There's a woman, I just want to, um, who I really love her work, Adrian, Adrian Marie Brown. I don't know if you've heard of this book, mm -hmm. um, but this is um, just a very accessible um, approach to systems change. Um, and it's not necessarily based in you know, MIT or you know, Harvard. It's, it's just wisdom <laughs> experience, but very profound. So um, I think we just have to really not locate systems thinking in one um you know university or echelon of society so well one of the efforts or the intentions of this entire series has been to at least begin to within the research community expand the venn diagram if you will of of which disciplines and cultures and cultural approaches and cultural artifacts like fairy tales and folk tales um embody or express um, a holistic, integrative, spatial, or systems approach um, to looking at complex challenges or just living systems. Um, so the one of the challenges in that expansion conversation is to, 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 to incorporate, to understand, to not appropriate, but to have shared wisdom with 
collective indigenous cultures. Um, and you know, one of the things that has come out of the, uh, you know, the cultural artifacts of indigenous heritage and, 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 oh, and human history are our tales and our, our fairy tales and things. But, but there's a, a, a huge living, breathing world of indigenous cultures uh, still existing today that, that I, I feel like that those conversations really never happen except at, the, at a in very, very rare intersections. And then it's sort of fetishized over here as opposed to being this cooperative. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one place where I feel like that integration of indigenous knowledge and wisdom uh, and systems is happening beautifully is a, at the Academy for Systems Change. Okay. Um, Melani, I hope I'm saying her name, Goodchild, is um, central to that work there. And um, it's just, beautifully woven together. It's not one discipline and then another. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm learning myself, the Buckminster Fuller residencies, I, there was a number of other fellows in it that um, came from a more indigenous perspective and were teaching me. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, absolutely, it has to be, it has to, we just have to recognize that that knowledge is held in very, in lots of different places. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, you know, my, the little piece I'm working on is the glossary decoder ring between the... Oh, I love that stuff. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm all about that. I'm constantly... Right. No, I know. But it's like, oh, I want, I want the polyplexus community to join us for that. That's, the, that, that's a, that's my intention. Well, let's create it. That's a, that's not a, that's no problem. Let's do it. We, you can, you find us here. Um, all right. So we're, we're, we're coming up toward our, and I've got a nice big juicy question from, from Mickey. All right. <clears throat> Clear my throat. How might we take the work of the SFI the BFI and others to bring their literacy efforts around complexity science and systems thinking and bring it down to K through eight. Hmm. Goes on to say, one approach might be to apply, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Schoenfeld's TRU dimensions framework to these topics or foster a series of new complexity and systems thinking games like those made by Nikki Case, example, the evolution of trust. That, my friend, is a classic polyplexus question. Unpack that. Okay. I, I can reread, I can break it into parts for you. Let's, let's start with the, the first piece of how can we take the work of folks like SFI and BFI and many others, yourself included, and bring those literacy efforts to K through eight? So I, and by the way, thank you for that question because it's very thoughtful and rich and aligned with what I care about. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so, and I know Nikki Case, and I think that's a great, so, so let's just stay focused on that. How can we bring, basically what's working right now? What's out there? What's, what are exemplars, right? Mm -hmm. More integrated into K through eight. Well, um, what I'm seeing is that, I'm just gonna give you one of my experiences over the last you know, eight months. What I'm seeing is um, organizations like the Waters Center, let's say, or the Center for Echo Literacy in Berkeley, the Waters Center, Arizona, Center for Echo Literacy, Berkeley, um, have already over years become integrated into school systems and are, I just did a, some work with the, the water center with school administrators and staff and teachers um, in, um, let's say, California. It doesn't necessarily matter where. But they're in a multi-year initiative to develop systems thinking in their staff and, and ultimately in students. So first, I think they're actually going at the staff, you know, the educator, administrator level. Um, which trick, which influences the students. So I think um, you know, having conversations. So is that Mickey? Mickey, you know, looking up the Center for Echo Literacy, looking up the Waters uh, Center. Um, I just got approached by another school for systems thinking. I think there's a whole school, growing school group. Um, and 
and it, and bringing those resources to support that are that train that's already moving is is one i do think even more maybe this is your your magic ring idea but i do think it would certainly help to bring the far flung pieces together to um, bring see what happens is which is really ironic is that the systems world can get very siloed you know mm -hmm. i'm from system dynamics that's my experience i'm from uh, ecology ecoliteracy yeah. i'm from agent-based modeling right um, and never the twain shall meet which makes absolutely no sense that's why i keep looking at that oh, the overlap of concepts and tools like come on family we're a family <laughs> you know yeah. um so, speak my language. <laughs> yes. So to Mickey's question, I think contributing to the coherence and the collection of, you know, resources and, and people and putting them in age bands, you know, start doing the research that goes with it to say this is, you know, developmentally appropriate. Um, it does take, it's going to, it requires that ability to step back. That's where foundation funding could be really helpful. That's where, um, just like the cancer-free economy example, that is multiple disciplines getting together to make that effort happen. You know, it's not just me, it's not just, you know. Right, um, and so just, do you have any specific call outs to the, the, the open question of what about applying uh, true dimensions, the TRU dimensions or the Nikki case Work. Well, I don't know the true dimensions. Okay. You have to t explain that to me. He said Schoenfeld's TRU dimensions framework. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's something to go look up. I will. Um, offline, um, but Nikki Case, uh, the example, the evolution of trust. Yeah, I know, I know some of Nikki's work, but I'm just gonna, you know, that specific example, I'm trying to think if I've seen that one. Um, I, I'm trying to understand what's the question, you know, it, can you integrate that into K through 12, K through eight education? Absolutely. I believe that the, the, the open yes. question, what this could yes. this, this be an approach? A hundred percent. So what I will tell you that I got, I've been really inspired and affirmed by, I guess, is like I mentioned, I did um, with the Danella Meadows Institute. Mm -hmm. I uh, worked with David McCauley, who's also a children's author. Uh, the way things work, you would love it. It's your kind of book. And um, so we created a, a short animation around, you know, systems in everyday life. I found when, um, actually my sister-in-law is a fourth grade teacher. She said, wow, you're not going to believe this, but on our New York state standards, your, that animation that you did and your book, Connected Wisdom, are integrated into the standards. So that tells me that Nikki Case mm -hmm. can be integrated as an exemplar if it's tied tightly to the rubrics, you know, to the to the different. Um, I have to look at it to do that work, but that that integration work, um, the way to do that, and that my experience is to have somebody on the ground, somebody in the, you know, curriculum design, um, and then you know the, the resource maker. And I'm learning that I, I can, I just have to you know, do the research myself to understand what are the standards, what are educators actually dealing with, you know, that, that I've become much more realistic about that over time and empathetic. <laughs> right, sure. Um, well, so as we, as we wrap up here, do you have any, any closing thought on, on, on if there's just a couple takeaways? from this topic and this particular slice of conversation that you, you really want folks to hold fundamental in their, in their minds and then, and then dig deeper, right? You've, you, you've shared with us a lot of resources that we on the polyplexus side will attempt to type into the discussion threads on the incubator, but um, what would you like, what, if, if you can only send us away with a couple of things, what, what do you hope the takeaways are for people today? I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a big question. But I'll just say, I think briefly that, okay, there are such thing as systems. We weren't taught to think about them, but we are living and breathing in them. We're influencing them and are influenced by them. Um, so 
let's be empathetic to those who operate in short, you know, short term ways, who make matters worse, who have a fix that backfires, who make policies that address, you know, one part, but actually cause a problem somewhere else, because we are, we are not explicitly taught to think in systems, most people in the US and probably broader. So the fundamental thing I'd say in whatever walk of life, whatever work, whether it's in you know, government, you know, systems change in developing countries, um, wherever, that um, first leading with that empathy to then to draw people into that systems view. But you have to do the work to hold that perspective. You cannot assume that people come with that perspective. Over time, you start to develop more people mm -hmm. who fundamentally have that orientation, but it takes time. It, it's the remembering what you already know. You know, um, working with farmers, you know, around systems, so much resonance, but they, it's not like that's that they learned necessarily about systems thinking, you know, but they, Anyway, do you see what I'm saying? So I think yeah. that would be the number one. Okay, what a nice place to, 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 um, to wrap this up. Linda, thank you so much for your time and your, your career in this effort. And we think we've touched on many, many ways that people can collaborate, um, not only directly with you, but intersect within this greater space. And I hope so, yeah, good. And thank you for in inviting me, I'm, I'm really, impressed by what you're doing and supportive so thank you thank you yeah. more and soon everybody uh, okay. take care Linda bye bye take care bye